Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming out for Cancer Center Pizza Talk, i.e. Grand Rounds. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, today's uh, speaker, Dr. Jennifer Trowbridge. Um, Jennifer is an outstanding scientist from uh, the Jackson Laboratory in Bar Harbor, Maine. Many of you know Jax because the mice come from there, but um, in case you didn't know, and I think most of you do know, there's also an astounding uh, research program there, uh, which is uh, spearheaded by a number of really, really smart faculty who can uh, take the mouse genetics and other resources at that institution and really bring them to uh, fruition. And I think you'll see a lot of that today in uh, Jen's talk. So um, Jen's training background is really extraordinary. Um, she did her PhD at the University of Western Ontario with uh, Mickey Batia and did some uh, very elegant work looking at the role of developmental pathways like Wnt and Hedgehog in HSC regulation, and HSC is hematopoietic stem cell in this case. Um, after that, she transitioned to a postdoc over at the Dana-Farber with Stu Orkin, who of course is also a, a legend in the field of gene regulation and epigenetics, and there she did some seminal work uh, understanding the role of DNA methyltransferase 1 in epigenetic regulation of both normal and leukemic hematopoiesis. In 2012, she started her position over at Jackson Laboratory, and uh, just this year was promoted to um, associate. If you look at her record of, of funding and awards, she has basically run the table on about everything as a, as a younger hematologist that you can get, including a postdoctoral fellowship from uh, Leukemia Lymphoma Society, uh, Ash Scholar Award, um, Ellison Medical Foundation, New Scholar, V Foundation, um, also uh, recently Evans MDS uh, Foundation, and an R01. So she is very, very well funded, has uh, come up with some amazing and creative science within her uh, six years so far as faculty including um, a very beautiful paper in JX Med to understand how uh, multipotent progenitors that give rise to mature cells are changed by aging, and also uh, a better understanding in, nature, in a Nature Communications publication about the epigenetic signature of leukemia-initiating cells and being able to actually isolate leukemia-initiating cells from bulk leukemia based on epigenetic signature. Um, I'm sure what she'll tell us today is, is equally, if, if not more, exciting. Uh, Jen, thank you so much for, for being here. It's really a pleasure. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Petrus, for that very flattering introduction. And uh, for those of you who don't know, this is the third time that I've attempted to come to Colorado to uh, give a talk. The previous two times were foiled due to weather. Um, so I'm thrilled to be here. It's kind of a miracle that you can fly from Maine to Colorado in December and not experience inclement weather. So the third time's a charm in this case. And I couldn't be happier to be here to, to uh, share with uh, you our data um, looking uh, at aging. Um, and I'll present some data not only on normal hematopoietic aging, but also this um, concept of clonal hematopoiesis or CHIP and how that influences progression to myelodysplastic syndrome and acute myeloid leukemia. So as you all probably know already, our lifespan or the lifespan of the global population is increasing. This graph, let's see if I can get my pointer to work. There we go. Um, this graph is showing um, from 2015 projected out to 2050, the proportion of the population aged 60 years or older. And the darkest shaded countries represent 30% or more of the population, which will represent an expansion of our aged population. Really, the challenge in managing an aged population is the challenge of health span. So this graph is showing average health span versus lifespan in the United States. Here, health span is defined as the number of years that you are free from chronic disease that are the leading causes of death. So things like cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, cancer is also a big one. Um, so the concept here is that if we have an extended lifespan or a larger aged population without making any headway into how to keep those people healthy for longer, um, essentially you're increasing your pool of individuals that are going to be suffering from these diseases. So our strategy here is to try to 
um, develop interventions or strategies to extend health span along with lifespan. We focus on the hematopoietic system, obviously. Um, there are a number of aging-associated changes in hematopoiesis. There are decrease, decreases in normal functionality of the system, including decreases in function of the immune system, increased susceptibility to infections, um, associated also with antibody production. Red blood cell production is impaired, leading to or contributing to anemia in elderly populations. And then, of course, there's also an increase in the proportion or frequency of diseases and disorders within the hematopoietic system. And the graphs at the bottom show two examples of this, myelodysplastic syndrome on the left. So here on the x-axis, we're showing increasing age. On the y-axis is incidence rate per 100,000 individuals in the United States. So these are clearly aging, this is clearly an aging-associated disease. And uh, as well, acute myeloid leukemia is clearly aging-associated. So this is the requisite um, slide to show when I'm going to be talking about hematopoietic stem and progenitor cell biology. And I'm sure you've all seen this slide many, many times, and so I won't belabor the point. But simply to say, um, the system is set up or thought to be set up such that there's a population of stem cells that reside um, at the top of this hierarchy that eventually give rise to all of the mature cells of the hematopoietic system and are responsible for lifelong production of all of these mature cell types. They have this specialized property um, termed self-renewal, which is shown by the curved arrow, which means that the stem cells have the ability to replenish their own population as well as differentiate to produce all the mature cells. And all everything in the middle, I think, is subject to um, year by year, who you talk to. Um, so there are clearly differentiation stages in between a stem cell and a mature cell, um, and, and the specifics of that are less important to talk about right now. So with respect to hematopoietic aging, this is a much more simplistic view of what I just showed you, right? Stem cells, a bunch of progenitors, and then mature cells. Um, we already know, as I mentioned, a lot of the aging-associated changes in these different cell, cell compartments. So with aging, we see decrease in red blood cells. Um, there's an increase in the proportion of myeloid cells, both with respect to the peripheral blood and in the bone marrow. And this is thought to relate somehow, possibly, to increase susceptibility to acute myeloid leukemia. But I think the mechanisms there are still very unclear at this point. And there's also a decrease in lymphoid um, cells, as I mentioned. With respect to the stem cell population, the cell at the top, uh, many other uh, labs, as well as our lab, have observed an expansion of that population when you measure that population by cell surface markers, so phenotypic stem cells are expanded. Um, however, on a per cell basis, it appears that those cells have a reduced functionality. And what I mean by that is the ability for them to, upon transplantation, home to the bone marrow and engraft or uh, reconstitute the entire hematopoietic system in recipients. Now, uh, some work published from my lab uh, now a couple of years ago that I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I wanted to briefly mention is that we really looked at the, um, a lot of the intermediate populations, progenitor populations, and how those are altered in aging. And what we discovered was that there was a specific decrease in the progenitor cells that are um, uh, biased toward producing lymphoid cell types. So there's a loss of those cells. And the residual cells uh, appear to be now biased toward producing myeloid cells rather than lymphoid cells. So we think that there's also shifts in the progenitor compartment that occur with aging that are contributing to some of the pathologies that I mentioned. So in terms of an overall goal of the lab um, in this idea of extending hematopoietic health span, we really think about this concept with um, sort of it's split into two. There are really two parts of this. The first part is how do we improve the regenerative capacity of stem and progenitor cells with age and the balanced regenerative capacity, while at the same time preventing cancer from being initiated from these same cellular compartments, since that is one of the you know, leading causes of death that limits health span of the hematopoietic system. So we can divide a lot of what we do in my lab into these two sort of categories or topics. 
Um, and I don't have time to talk about everything, so I've, I'm highlighting a few key papers here that we've published from the lab in case you're interested in going back and reading these further. Really, the first, uh, what I'm going to talk about first is the idea of uh, how to restore balanced regeneration or regenerative capacity of stem and progenitor cells in aging. And then the second part, I'm going to talk about um, uh, ideas that we have to decrease uh, susceptibility to blood cancer. So for the first part, um, this idea of, of regenerative capacity in aging being impaired, um, some of the key questions that we have, um, that the field has, are, 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 I'll raise two at this point. One is, what is the right cell type to go after? So I've shown um, uh, previously that the stem cells are clearly impaired with aging. There are many populations of progenitor cells that are also impaired with aging. Um, in order to abrogate some of the aging-associated defects, what are, this, what are the relevant cell populations to target? And then the second big question is that these, these cells don't reside in um, isolation, right? They exist in a very complex um, bone marrow microenvironment space, right, where they're interacting physically with other cell types and receiving cytokines, growth factors, and other things that are produced by the cells in their microenvironment. And so when you think about aging and interventions um, to sort of restore healthy function of the hematopoietic system, should we be also thinking about interventions to target the bone marrow microenvironment and how important is that relative to targeting the stem or progenitor cells themselves? So in order to um, uh, start, you know, when we initiated these studies, um, when we were thinking about aging, in the literature, most of the published studies have done more of a binary comparison between young and old mice. And old mice are usually defined as 24, 26-month-old, 2-year-old mice, right? When you do that binary comparison, almost everything that you look at is different, right? So we thought that that um, was, is, is kind of a complicated model, right? And so we were curious as to a lot of those aging-associated phenotypes, when do we really see them start to emerge? And we had the opportunity at the time um, within our animal colony to have cohorts of mice spaced one month apart all the way from two months old to 24 months old. Um, and so we started to really look at the kind of the dynamics of aging, if you will. And what we see on the left, this is a phenotypic stem cell expansion, as I mentioned, is aging associated, which we see clearly um, stem cells, uh, a, a frequency of stem cells is higher in old mice compared to young mice, but we already observe it to be significantly higher between 8 to 12 months of age. So this is much closer to middle age in these mice. The second uh, major phenotype that we looked at is this myeloid bias um, that I mentioned, which we observe in both peripheral blood and bone marrow that is aging associated. And so that's shown on the right. And you can see in old mice, um, there are clearly more myeloid cells and fewer B cells um, compared to young mice. If you go back and look in, in the same time window, 9 to 14 months of age, we already see significant accumulation or increased frequency of myeloid cells in the peripheral blood compared to young mice. So this really, uh, we thought middle age might be a key age uh, to be able to perhaps reduce the complexity of what's going on when you look at a really old mouse um, and try to look at what the drivers or the causative changes are at middle age that are sort of setting the stage for some of these aging associated changes. So uh, one of the first experiments that we did uh, was to ask what's the importance of the age of the environment versus the age of the stem cells or progenitor cells themselves. And so we did these um, reciprocal bone marrow transplant experiments where we're taking um, purified by uh, fact sorting hematopoietic stem cells out of young mice and transplanting them into lethally irradiated young recipient mice or middle-aged recipient mice or middle-aged stem cells into middle-aged recipient mice. And what I'm going to show you is data from these mice at six months post-transplant, where we've looked at the engraftment level, so the regenerative um, capacity, if you will, of the stem cells that we're injecting in, and then um, the proportion of myeloid cells relative to um, lymphoid cell types. So first, this is looking at overall chimerism, so frequency of donor-derived cells in the peripheral blood. What we see, as we would have expected, is when you take a middle-aged stem cell and put it into a middle-aged recipient, there's impaired um, engraftment or regenerative capacity. 
to, compared to a young stem cell into a young environment. The young stem cell into a middle-aged microenvironment is somewhere in the middle, right? So they're not quite as good at regenerating, perhaps, um, the hematopoietic compartment in, a, in context of a middle-aged mouse or middle-aged bone marrow microenvironment um, compared to a young. Uh, we also looked at frequency of donor-derived phenotypic stem cells in the bone marrow, and we see something very similar. So there's a decrease in um, the ability of middle-aged HSCs to regenerate themselves um, in a middle-aged recipient, and a young stem cell into a middle-aged recipient is somewhere in the middle, um, but not, uh, so it, it partially explains, I would say, the phenotype, but not, not completely. Um, however, when we look at this uh, myeloid bias to hematopoiesis, which is another aspect, right, of the aging phenotype, uh, we see a much stronger uh, myeloid bias uh, when we take young stem cells and put them into middle-aged recipient. We almost completely recapitulate middle-aged stem cell into middle-aged environment, suggesting that the uh, bone marrow microenvironment at middle age um, is, is significantly contributing to the increased proportion of myeloid relative to lymphoid cells in the peripheral blood. So you might ask, what if we do the converse? What if we take a middle-aged stem cell and put it back into a young bone marrow microenvironment? And so that's this experiment. And what we see, this is in terms, again, of um, overall chimerism in the peripheral blood of donor-derived cells. Um, we see a, a, a robust increase in um, a, a regenerative capacity or chimerism in those um, animals when we take a middle-aged stem cell and put it back into a young recipient. This is looking at um, frequency of donor-derived stem cells. Um, we also see an increase, increase in um, uh, uh, that proportion uh, when we take middle-aged stem cell and put it into a young environment. And then finally, looking at the proportion of myeloid relative to lymphoid cells, we do see um, increase in both um, B cells and T cells and decrease in uh, myeloid cells in the peripheral blood when we do this. Um, so we think that the age of the microenvironment is contributing to aging-associated phenotypes at middle age. Um, this summarizes what I just showed you, but the key question at the bottom, which may be obvious to you right now, uh, to ask is what are the factors in the bud marrow microenvironment that are really responsible for this? So in order to start to tackle that, we used a two-pronged approach. So we utilized some single-cell RNA-seq data that we had um, published already, kind of collected in the lab. This is comparing um, uh, two, uh, uh, two different ages of mice, four-month-old compared to 14-month-old. We had sorted these, um, they're called lymphoid-primed multipotent progenitors, the, a progenitor population, out of young versus middle-aged mice and done single-cell RNA-seq. This is using the C1. And you can see by this principal component analysis that we see a nice separation between four-month-old and 14-month-old. So we use this data and um, ingenuity pathway analysis to try to predict what would be altered upstream, um, potentially coming from the bone marrow mark environment, that would result in these transcriptional changes, or predicted to result in these transcriptional changes. Then we also took those same candidates using uh, cytokine arrays or ELISAs in screened young, middle-aged, and old animals to see whether any of those predicted regulators were actually altered in the bone marrow microenvironment itself. And so here we used um, bone marrow fluid. So we took, um, essentially flushed the bone marrow, pelleted out the cells, and then used that fluid for um, elysis or cytokine arrays. So I'll, I'll show you that data. Um, <clears throat> the the um, punchline is that insulin-like growth factor um, IGF-1 and IGF-2 were the, the, by far the strongest um, candidates from this analysis. So this is just looking at the... Um, RNA-seq data and then the IPA, ingenuity pathway analysis, these were the predicted upstream regulators. Um, this is showing significance by p-value, not directionality. So I'm not showing whether they're up or down, just that they're different. Um, we then took these candidate pathways and looked <clears throat> from published um, gene expression data and gene expression um, data repositories, what of the, which of these factors would be predicted to be expressed by cells within the bone marrow microenvironment and the, where we saw reciprocal expression of the receptor that binds to that ligand on the stem and progenitor cells themselves, right? And so we saw that the IGF, IGF-1 and IGF-2, um, were our top candidates using this type of analysis. 
So here you can see the gene expression level in red is very high, in blue is low, and this is relative expression. So these are populations of stromal cells in the bone marrow where we see very high levels of expression of the ligands, IGF-1 and IGF-2, and relatively low expression on the stem progenitor cells themselves. Whereas when we look at the major receptor that binds to these ligands, IGF-1 receptor, very high levels on the stem of progenitor cells and relatively lower on the stromal cells. So we then did the ELISA, as I mentioned, on the bone marrow fluid, and what we observed is that the IGF-1 concentration in the bone marrow fluid is significantly decreased with aging, and we saw a significant decrease um, at, in middle age in mice, um, which was also important, an important um, 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 thing for us to look at. Uh, we also looked at IGF-2 concentration, didn't see significant changes with aging. So we um, decided to focus on the role of IGF-1 in the context of aging. So what I'm telling you here is that we see in the bone marrow microenvironment a specific decrease in levels of IGF-1 with aging, and we think that this may be contributing to the aging-associated changes in hematopoietic stem cells and their ability to uh, regenerate hematopoiesis. So what we did um, as an early experiment in order to prove to ourselves that this pathway was important, um, we, we took on a pretty challenging experiment, which was um, to take middle-aged mice and attempt to restore or increase levels of IGF-1 specifically in the bone marrow and see whether that altered any of the phenotypes that I've, I've showed you. So we did this by intrafemoral injection. So we're injecting these recombinant um, proteins directly into um, the bone marrow microenvironment. And uh, we did uh, some studies looking at IGF-1 alone and then realized that there was already reports in the literature showing that IGF-1 needs to be co-injected with one of its binding um, partner proteins, IGF-BP3, in order to get sustained increase in the IGF-1 levels, both in the bone matrix and the bone marrow. So we realized that, and this is based on the sh very short half-life of IGF-1 itself, it needs to be um, co-injected. So we co-injected both IGF-1 and BP3 together. Um, these are the controls um, of IGF-1 or BP3 alone, and then comparing middle age to a young mouse, where we see in the middle-aged mice have greater myeloid cells and reduced lymphoid cells in the peripheral blood. And what we see when we inject in the IGF-1 plus the BP3 is um, uh, something that looks a lot more like a young mouse, right, in terms of uh, proportion of myeloid to lymphoid cells in the peripheral blood. We also looked in the bone marrow um, and see something very similar, right? So although the proportions of cells in the bone marrow and peripheral blood are different, what we see is that there is a decrease in myeloid, increase in lymphoid um, when we treat middle-aged mice with the IGF-1 plus BP3. So this was um, nice for us, a nice in vivo uh, sort of validation of our model to some degree, right? A, a key question remains, what are the cells that are really responding to this IGF-1 supplementation? Um, there are some different possibilities here, right? It's possibly that the hematopoietic stem cells are directly responding to the IGF-1 um, based on the expression of the receptor on the surface of those cells. It's also possible that one of the progenitor populations, like the multipotent progenitor 4 or lymphoid prime multipotent progenitor, is responding directly to IGF-1. And also important to to point out that it could also be an indirect effect, right? By injecting recombinant protein in vivo, it doesn't tell us whether it's a direct or indirect effect. Um, so we've been doing more um, experiments to try to address this. This is a really simplistic schematic of IGF-1 uh, and IGF signaling. So the IGF-1 ligand can bind to homodimers of the IGF-1 receptor or a heterodimer of the IGF-1 and insulin receptor. These got phosphorylated and then um, activate at least two distinct pathways, um, potentially more. Uh, one is a PI3 kinase AKT, and the other is a RASMAP kinase. And so what I'm showing you here are in vitro experiments where we've isolated the long-term hematopoietic stem cells or this um, lymphoid-primed multipotent progenitor population, stimulated them for short periods of time, 30 uh, 30 minutes um, with recombinant IGF-1 and looked at um, phosphorylation of the IGF-1 receptor and then phosphorylation of AKT, which is what we decided to start with. Um, so we see that the HSCs clearly have response to this um, IGF, recombinant IGF-1 by phosphorylating their 
IGF-1 receptor and phosphorylation of AKT, whereas the MPP4 population under the same conditions, we don't see evidence of response. So this is pointing us toward the HSCs being a, 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 a responder cell, right, one of the responder cells. Um, we also have some um, in vitro um, functional data to show that when you, t this is in a co myeloid colony forming unit assay, so this is like a myeloid differentiation. So when you take, um, this is a hematopoietic stem and progenitor cell pool um, from a young mouse compared to a middle-aged mouse, the middle-aged mice make more of those myeloid colonies. And if you add, sorry, if you add increasing doses of the IG recombinant IGF-1, you can see dose-dependent suppression of this myeloid cell overproduction, similar to what we saw in vivo. Um, there's still work to be done here. Here. Um, what we're what we have ongoing at the moment are really utilizing the genetic models, right? So we have the ability to knock out the IGF-1 ligand using conditional knockout models in the recipients and the ability to knock out the IGF-1 receptor on donor stem cells or donor bone marrow to be able to examine um, this concept of direct versus indirect effect of the IGF-1 on the stem cell population versus an indirect effect through some other intermediates. And so this is still ongoing. Uh, and then the second part that we're, we're trying is whether this um, supplementation of IGF-1 at middle age has any potential effect to extend um, to, or, or to uh, be durable, I guess, in the absence of continued treatment um, into older age. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know when I know. Uh, so that sort of summarizes the first part of the talk. So middle age has been really key for us um, in terms of um, um, uh, allowing us to study a slightly less complex model compared to very advanced age of animals. And IGF-1 remains our sort of best candidate at the moment. So the second part of my talk is really more focused on um, clonal hematopoiesis and myelodysplastic syndrome and AML. So uh, we have thought in our lab um, uh, quite a lot and done uh, quite a lot of experiments to look at the cell context dependence of mutations. So what that really means is, um, is the idea that it matters, not just the mutation that you get, but what cell incurs that mutation it will also influence the outcome of that mutation. And so the, the, our published work, which I'll just um, mention really briefly, um, utilized the MLLAF9 retroviral overexpression model for acute myeloid leukemia. And what we did was to sort out using flow cytometry different populations of stem and progenitor cells transduce them all in parallel, and then transplant them into recipients. And based on the survival curve at the bottom, you can see that it actually depends on what cell you transduce with this virus. So the hematopoietic stem cells and multipotent progenitors in blue and orange lead to the most rapid and aggressive development of AML, whereas if you transduce a granulocyte macrophage progenitor, only about 50% of those mice develop um, AML and it takes a longer time. Um, now, having seen this data, you know, we were compelled to ask the question, how would you ever know where a tumor came from if the, mutation is the, the mutations are the same, largely the gene expression patterns in these different tumors are the same? How, how are we going to be able to go back in time and know was it a stem cell or a progenitor cell that incurred that mutation? And so we were inspired by a lot of studies that were being done at that time in our lab and other labs, um, looking at open chromatin profiling using a tax seek. And this, this heat map summarizes what, what we were so excited about. So if you compare normal populations of stem and progenitor cells looking at gene expression, they're very highly correlated. What that means is there's not a lot of difference at the level of gene expression between a hematopoietic stem cell and a multipotent progenitor. If you look at uh, chromatin accessibility using a tax seek, what you see is those correlations decrease, which implies that the signatures are easier to resolve at the, between those two cell states at the level of chromatin accessibility compared to the level of gene expression. And so we decided to go back to those tumors that I just showed you and do a tax seek and look for signatures of chromatin accessibility that may be able to tell us in the bulk tumors where did they come from. And um, because this is published, I'll just show you one example of one locus. Um, so this is a locus, at the first intron of a gene called HOXA5. It's open in leukemias derived from stem cells, but closed in leukemias derived from the other progenitor cells that we tested. 
Now, we decided to um, ask as best we could whether these open chromatin signatures would be predictive of outcome in human AML. And the best we could do uh, was to use, uh, at the time, um, human uh, de novo AML TCGA data that looked at DNA methylation patterns. So the idea is that those are opposite, right? Open chromatin should have low level of methylation. Closed chromatin should have high, high level of methylation. So when we take this specific region of the mouse genome and um, uh, compare it to the appropriate you know, uh, region of the human genome, um, we can actually see differences in terms of the level of methylation at that locus and how it predicts um, um, overall survival. So low methylation, as I mentioned, would be um, open chromatin, is associated with poor survival compared to high level of methylation, which would be closed. And so that fits uh, very nicely with our model. And again, this is one locus, but in our, our paper, we managed to derive sort of a signature that summarizes many loci um, that uh, uh, are actually quite uh, uh, predictive of overall survival um, in the de novo AML TCGA data. So we're really pleased with that. Um, there are limitations to this model, as you, I'm sure, well recognize. It's an overexpression system, so that's different from what's going to happen in people. Um, it's also a single hit model, and it's quite aggressive in terms of time to disease development. So it doesn't really allow you to ask about um, combinations of mutations um, over time. And then, of course, it's most relevant to individuals that carry that translocation, um, which is, uh, you know, a, a low frequency. So we, we looked at the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the sequencing data from the TCGA AML data set. Um, and, and you all know this, um, the three of the most common mutations, um, the somatic mutations that were found are in these three genes, um, DNA methyltransferase, DNMT3A, the nucleof nucleophosmin, NPM1, and um, FLT3, tyrosine kinase. And uh, furthermore, uh, there's a predicted order to which these mutations occur, right? So um, mutations in genes like DNMT3A are thought to be um, early mutations, i.e. they are, can be found in normal hematopoietic stem cells in patients that have AML. And furthermore, um, some mutations in DNMT3A can confer a selective advantage onto those stem cells, setting the stage for what's now called clonal hematopoiesis or CHIP, which is essentially overrepresentation of that mutation in the population of, of stem cells. Um, and that is thought to set the stage for acquiring additional mutations that then cause progression to MDS or AML. And so the, um, when we were thinking about how to model these, uh, we realized quite quickly the limitations in mouse models that are currently available. And that is that you can um, express mutants or um, knock out these genes in combination, but you have to combine them essentially at the same time, right? You can knock out two genes or three genes in the same cells at the same time. What you can't do with existing mouse models in vivo is express a mutation and wait and then express another mutation or reverse the order, um, you know, things like that. So we decided to generate some novel mouse models that we thought would be useful to address some of these questions. So the first mouse that we created is a knock-in of the D most common um, DNMT3A mutation found in human AML. That's the R882H. In mouse, it's R878H. Um, we used a uh, sort of Tyler Jacks um, lock stop locks type of strategy, which means that we can preserve um, wild type expression of the DNMT3 gene, a biallelic wild type expression, um, until we induce a Cree recombination of that locus, and then we get mutant allele expression. Right? So this is really well mod modeling um, acquisition of a somatic mutation. It's a knock-in, so we're doing it at the endogenous locus, et cetera. We also decided to make a mutation in the gene NPM1, a similar strategy, but we made this inducible using a different recombinase. It's a flip recombinase inducible mutation. So now we have the ability to choose where and when we express the DNMT3 mutation and where and when we express the NPM1 mutation. And so you can imagine the kind of questions that can be addressed using this model. Questions about cell context specificity of those mutations, like I showed you for MLAF9. Questions about order of mutations in development of AML or other pathologies. And then uh, we hope that this will provide mechanisms into uh, how AML is initiated or how the progression from clonal hematopoiesis to AML, you know, kind of what happens in, in between. 
So I'm going to show you some data using these MUS models. So the first one is the DNMT3A mutation, um, which, as I mentioned before, is found um, at a, a high frequency in human AML, but is also found at high frequency or reasonably high frequency in clonal hematopoiesis. So when we express this mutation alone, this is a heterozygous mutation driven by MX1 Cree recombinase, we see when you compare mutant to control mice, this is at um, three months after um, uh, activating Cree uh, recombinase expression. We see increase in long-term hematopoietic stem cells and short-term hematopoietic stem cells and a multipotent progenitor population, MPP3. So it clearly is having some sort of uh, ability to expand the proportion of these cells in the bone marrow. Furthermore, we did a competitive bone marrow transplantation experiment where we mixed together equal proportions of wild type and mutant cells and transplant them into recipient mice. And what we see in that context is a clear selective advantage of cells carrying that mutation that in fact increases over time as you um, uh, observe those um, uh, transplanted mice over time. Uh, so we think that this is a reasonable model of, of clonal hematopoiesis. Um, so then we wanted to build in the NPM1 mutation on the background of this DNMT3A mutation. And so this experiment is shown here. So we um, can induce um, the, the DNMT3A mutation first, allow that expansion that I just showed you in the stem and progenitor compartment to happen over three months, and then activate the NPM1 mutation using tamoxifen, and then observe what happens. So uh, we found something interesting, actually, in some of our controls. Um, so this is looking at our DNMT3A only control that didn't get the NPM1 mutation, right? And eventually, um, around, well, around a year, um, some of those mice died. Not all of them, but a few of them. And we said, what, you know, what's going on there? Are these mice getting AML? Uh, and so we looked, and we actually see that those mice uniformly have a myelodysplastic syndrome. So they, we see a pancytopenia, multilineage dysplasia, um, uh, you know, it seems to be a decent model for myelodysplastic syndrome, and so we're doing more work now to understand what is, what is that, what does it mean, and why do only some mice develop um, MDS and the rest don't, um, at least as far as we've observed them. So then when we add on the NPM1 mutation, um, in addition to the DNMT3A, the, this, actually this experiment is now complete. All of the mice have died. So it's a completely penetrant disease, um, and it's myeloproliferative disorder. Although in some mice, I'll tell you, they uh, seem to have a phenotype that is more of a mix between myelodysplastic syndrome and myeloproliferative disorder. So there's clearly a myeloid expansion and bias, but at the same time evidence of dysplasia um, and some other, um, you know, uh, normal to slightly low uh, white blood cell count and, and neutrophil count. Um, so we think this is an interesting phenotype. Um, and then furthermore, when we take those um, MPDs and transplant them into secondary recipient animals, we see a really rapid lethality, and those mice die uniformly of a cumulative leukemia phenotype. Um, so what we've done um, as a follow-on to these studies is actually ask whether there are any other recurrent somatic mutations that are coming up in these animals, right? So other somatic mutations being acquired, especially given the time to death in those initial um, uh, transplant recipients. It's suggestive that there might be some other things going on in that time frame. And so we collaborated with um, Ross Levine's lab at Memorial Sloan Kettering and used their impact panel. It's their targeted uh, mutation, somatic mutation profiling panel. And this is looking at mice that have, whoops, so um, each row or each column is in an individual mouse. Um, this first mouse had more of that mixed MDS and MPD phenotype. The second three have MPD phenotype. And then the last four are from the AMLs after the secondary transplant. And so what we saw only in the mouse with MDS-MPD um, phenotype was mutation in the tumor suppressor gene CUX1, um, which I later learned is associated with myelodysplastic syndrome in humans. Um, we also see mutations in RNA splicing factor um, machinery. Uh, when you compare that to the mice that uh, have the MPD phenotype, all of the mice with MPD phenotypes um, uniformly have mutations in NF1, um, and one of them had a mutation in BRAF. Um, and uh, um, I later learned that NF1 um, uh, seems to work through activation of the RASHRAF um, that kinase signaling pathway, and so it makes sense to see these um, these mutations uh, being associated with uh, myeloproliferative disorder in these animals. 
Um, and then finally, when we look at the, um, the mice that developed that rapid AML, um, they carry, uh, also, they all carry mutations predicted to activate that same signaling pathway, ras rafmap kinase, in addition to at least, uh, you know, one to three um, other mutations at reasonably high variant allele frequencies. Um, we're really interested to see mutations in genes like PTPN11, um, mutations at, uh, predicted to activate PA3 kinase signaling or FLT3 signaling, and then this other class of mutations um, that fall into genes associated with regulation of epi epigenome or epigenetics, um, including BRD4 and HDAC. Um, we're also really excited to see that uh, many of these somatic mutations, although not shown here, actually are, um, uh, are identical mutations to the recurrent somatic mutations found in human AML or in clonal hematopoiesis. For example, this IDH1 mutation is an IDH1 R132Q mutation. Um, the MS and KRS mutations are in G12, um, G12D or others. So th there are not so many examples that you can find in uh, mouse models where there is sort of spontaneous acquisition of somatic mutations that really are the same mutations that are observed in humans. Um, so we're uh, excited about this, the utility of this model. I want to show you one more experiment, which um, is our, the starting point for really capitalizing on the ability to independently regulate these mutations, right? So in this experiment, we've induced a mutation in DNMT3A and all of these mice at the same time, and then waited different lengths of time before we activate mutation in MPM1, right? So this is short term versus almost a year after um, expression of DNMT3A mutation. And so what we observe is that the ones that have a really long latency with only the DNMT only, <laughs> engineered to have the DNMT3 mutation only, um, have a much more uh, rapid development of disease once they get the NPM1 mutation. So this may imply that the duration of time in which you have a clonal hematopoiesis associated mutation or chip might affect um, a, a disease development or, or overall survival when you actually acquire additional mutations. You know, the other... Um, a really interesting conversation that I had today with uh, James De Gregory was about the age at which these animals actually die. And it's very interesting to note that despite, um, you know, what I'm showing you here, all of these mice die around the same age, um, slightly more than middle age, uh, 15, 16, 17 months of age. Ages at which we know that there are many, many changes going on, as I showed you in the, in the um, bone marrow microenvironment. So this is another um, question that we're, we're going to now test. Really, what is, um, what's going on here? Um, is, you know, one hypothesis is that there are other mutations being acquired on the background of that DNMT3 mutation that then affect the ability of NPM1 to transform those cells. Another hypothesis is that there are certain changes that occur with aging in the bone marrow microenvironment that put different selection pressures on these cells, right? And so it's the, essentially the age of the environment that's, that's driving this uh, phenotype. So we're going to keep doing those experiments. Um, but to summarize uh, what I've shown you is that we think that open chromatin profiles um, using ataxic or other uh, chromatin accessibility um, tools can be useful in discerning um, differences between different leukemias and where they originated from in terms of cell, cell specificity. And then we're applying that same um, uh, paradigm to these new models that we've created. So I showed you that different populations of stem and progenitor cells are, are each expanded as a consequence of the DNMT3 mutation. What we're wondering is which of those cells are now the ones susceptible to the NPM1 mutation that then drive um, MPD or AML, and what is the synergy um, between those mutations at a molecular level. So to wrap up, um, this is sort of the strategy that my lab takes. Uh, so we've used, um, obviously, mouse models being at JAX is a huge advantage. Um, we've, as I've said before, middle age has really been key for us, as well as some new genetically engineered mouse models. Um, we've done a lot of single cell biology that I didn't have a chance to talk to you about today. Um, not just transcriptomics, but also single cell functional assays, which I think are going to be very informative for us in trying to understand cell context specificity of different mutations. And then obviously epigenomics type assays. 
Paying a lot of attention to cellular context, I think, has been um, really valuable for us, right? So the same mutations or the same changes are not going to do the same thing in every single cell. Um, and in fact, have uh, perhaps exquisite specificity um, and synergy uh, between a mutation in the cell type and, and the outcome. Um, and we're looking for... I, I call it targets for health span, health span extension, but really what I mean is ways of, it, during aging, restoring balanced um, a production of hematopoietic cells, um, restoring regenerative capacity of stem and progenitor cells, boosting immune function, right, and also preventing cancer. And I, I think those are sort of, they're two sides of the same coin, and so we have to really think about those things in parallel. And lastly, I'll mention quickly, in terms of complex disease, we have some really interesting collaborative studies now that we're doing with other investigators at JAX that are focused on Alzheimer's disease and dementia, where they see um, a, a really significant role for inflammation in the pathology and the age um, in which those diseases develop in different individuals. And so we're looking at whether um, essentially you, you could identify um, individuals at risk for Alzheimer's disease and dementia based on looking in the peripheral butter and their bone marrow changes in stem cells and, and myeloid bias um, and what the both the genetic relationship is. Um, so for example, are there are there SNPs or the polymorphisms that are both affecting the hematopoietic system and susceptibility to things like Alzheimer's disease and dementia? And how can we think about um, sort of a, a system-wide um, approach to, to, to looking at complex disease? And with that, I'll thank the people in my lab who did this work. So um, the first part that I showed you was done largely by a postdoc in the lab, Kira Young, who has um, her own Ash Scholar Award. We're very proud of Kira. Um, and then the second part, all the mouse model stuff that I was telling you about, were done by two former um, people in the lab, really talented research assistants, believe it or not, um, uh, Matt and Becca. Matt is now an MSTP student at Vanderbilt, and Becca is doing her MD at Tufts, and so we're also extremely proud of those guys. Um, we have amazing scientific services at JAX. I can't speak highly enough about both the breadth and the depth of the resources we have available to us at JAX. Of course, our collaborators, um, our funding, and uh, this is my email address. So if anybody has um, follow-up questions, if we don't have time to, to get into it today, I'm always happy to talk with people back and forth by email. And also to mention, we uh, always have, uh, I shouldn't say always, right now, we have open spots for graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, um, as Eric mentioned. And our funding situation is really, really good. Um, so we, we're, um, we're always welcoming uh, uh, people to come and apply to the lab. So thanks very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, that's a great question. So most of our models, where we do transplant at least, we rely on radiation as a conditioning regimen. So we can't disentangle the effects of radiation plus um, effects on the age of the microenvironment. We're now um, starting to pilot studies using alternative conditioning strategies like busulfan, um, antibody-based targeting, uh, to be able to disentangle radiation from aging effects. Um, in terms of... Uh, effects of radiation on the bone marrow, at least at the doses we use, it's, it wipes out pretty much everything. I mean, when you do bone sections of mice, a short term, 24, 48 hours post radiation, there's really not, it's a, a, full of adipocytes and there's really nothing there. So I imagine that the effects on uh, populations of uh, cells in the bone marrow microenvironment may be even more dramatic in the short term than looking at an aged animal that hasn't been perturbed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do see um, some increase in expression of some of the inflammatory markers. So IL-1 is a good example, TNF-alpha, TGF-beta. Uh, we don't see a decrease in terms of the insulin-like growth factor, which I, I talked about, the IGF-1. We, we don't see that in the context of radiation. Mm -hmm. And so yet we found out in searching a subset of the genes there in for example, HOX-L5 does not change. I found at least an MML in this determination. Mm -hmm. And that's how we utilize that to trace the cell origin, right? So my question is, have you done some experiment with a different condition? Would you predict the 
little subset of genes that the methylation pattern will still uh, be the same in other words, it won't change. Right, I, I think that, that it will depend upon what the oncogene is and what sort of cell differentiation state it's acting on. So I suspect that it, that is a common principle, right? That if, a, if an oncogene can act, two separate oncogenes can act on the same, you know, essentially the same cell, like the same differentiation state of the cell. The signatures are, I, in, in my um, hypothesis, is the signatures would be much more similar than signatures in which you're comparing say something that can transform an HSC versus something that can transform a GMP, right? So in, um, in our study, we saw that while the majority of those loci retain, were retained, so the ones that were open stayed open during transformation, the one that were closed stayed closed, there was 20% of those loci that we found to be gained with transformation. So that suggests that the transformation is also having a different effect on different populations of cells. So it's not just, so our signatures aren't just signatures of, you know, a stem cell. I don't think we could have derived the same signatures if we just compared a stem cell to a multipotent progenitor. The signatures are looking at transformed from a stem cell versus transformed from a progenitor cell. Sure. Right. Yep, that's a good question. So I have we haven't done that specific experiment. That's one that's on the shelf, and you can appreciate that you know these are like one to two year experiments each. So it does it does take a long time. What I can tell you is that if we induce both mutations and address a question about the age of the microenvironment, so if we take the double mutant cells out of a young mouse and transfer them into a young recipient mouse versus an aged recipient mouse, the growth kinetics are much faster in the aged recipient, and the survival is significantly shorter in the aged recipient. So that supports that hypothesis that the age of the microenvironment is an important factor in, in, in terms of disease development. It could, yeah, I don't know what's happening in terms of change, intrinsic changes in those cells, but in theory, they all came from the same mouse, right? Yeah. Eric. So I've been really fascinated by what you showed. I'm very curious about the potential crosstalk between parts one and two of your lecture hmm. in the sense of whether or not the leukemias have a differential sensitivity to IGF-1 or a different requirement for it in the sense of not being able to simply substitute signal, whereas normal cells require IGF-1 when they don't get it in aging as part of the selective process. Right. Uh, those, those are some experiments that we're continuing to, to do in the lab. Um, I think, you know, increased IGF-1 is typically associated with poor prognosis in terms of cancer, right? IGF-1 is sort of a, 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 a bad cancer growth factor. So, um, you know, th this sort of um, brings up the point that I raised um, at the beginning, which is it's kind of two sides of the same coin, right? If we're increasing regenerative capacity, we need to also make sure we're not putting positive selection onto oncogenic containing, you know, oncogenic mutation containing clones of cells, right? Um, so we're optimistic that, at least in terms of a pro-regenerative context, that a short-term fairly low dose stimulation of those pathways was sufficient to see restored functionality. And I don't, I, I'm hopeful that that is not going to provide a large selective pressure onto say um, leukemic clones, but we don't know yet. And, and it's a really important point. Uh, IGF-1 might be, it might not be the right thing to go after, but the other thing we're keeping in mind is that although um, the external signals could be the same, the pathways that are activating downstream could be very different, and therefore those might be a better opportunity to come up with selective, you know, ways to select for pro-regeneration but not pro-tumor at the same time, right? Really interesting data set. I was curious about when you just gave the DNM to your 3A mutation, you let them age for a little bit, and you saw the increase in HSC, short term HSC and FPP3. Are you investigating whether or not that is the same mutation is 
giving the same advantage to those three populations independently, or are we just seeing that it's giving an advantage to the HSC that is then following a, a, a specific differentiation pathway to MPE? Yep, that's a great question. So we are doing a few different experiments to try to look at that. What we have done so far, which is probably not the best data to answer that question, um, but it provides some information, is RNA-seq. So we've re-isolated the different stem and progenitor populations with the DNMT3A mutation and done uh, RNA-seq profiling. And what we see is that the gene expression differences are very cell context dependent. So in a hematopoietic stem cell, that consequence of the DNMT3A mutation is a major repression in differentiation associated genes uniformly. Myeloid, lymphoid, everything goes way, way down. So it looks like, and this is consistent with other labs, um, it looks like sort of a differentiation block or partial differentiation block is happening at the level of the stem cells. When we look at, say, the MPB3 population, their expression of differentiation genes seems totally normal, not in increased or decreased. Um, but what we see is evidence for an increased expression in genes that we associate with self-renewal. Um, in, a, in a stem cell population. So perhaps a gain of aberrant self renewal in a progenitor population is, also has a positive selective advantage. But what we really need to do is um, build in, and we're collaborating on this, build in some clonal tracking studies to be able to determine who's coming from who, right? And I think that will better answer your question. Patricia? <laughs> I don't, is that is that true? It projected to be. I don't know. It's tough because the the size of the population is so different. I wonder. I would like to see the distribution of the data. <laughs> Maybe Canadians are healthier and living longer. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we see that in some of our transplantation studies, which I didn't show you because it's still too preliminary. Um, we do see a pro B cell differentiation, and that's consistent with um, work from David Scadden's lab, where they knocked out IGF-1 specifically in ostrix expressing cells and saw that there was an effect on their, their effect they, de they determined to be on a lymphoid progenitor, like a committed lymphoid progenitor population, but it was definitely influencing lymphoid differentiation of those cells. Um, so that's not necessarily to say that the stem cell effect is going to be the same. So I think we need to really disentangle, you know, who is doing what to whom, right? Like what are the different differentiation effects of, of, of signaling? I, I suspect it's two independent phenomenon, um, but I don't know. We would need to do, I, I think we have the, these like single cell in vitro assays up and running well enough now that we can test that. Changes in sort of fate or bias of differentiation versus studying it at the population level, which is everything I've showed you here, where we can't really determine. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. We haven't, do we have any data? We, I don't think we have any data to, to address that. Um, yeah, it's a, real, it's a really good question. So in a lot of the studies looking at IGF and aging in the bone, it's been done in the context of frailty. And so there, there they see clear um, uh, positive effects of stimulation with IGF in old mice and rodent models with respect to sort of the bone density and um, resistance to things like fractures, which was the whole point of that paper that I showed one figure from. Um, it was really, IGF is really being sort of uh, thought of as a sort of, res a, you know, pro-resilience in terms of um, bone, you know, health. Um, how that impacts, 
on the hematopoietic stem cells themselves. I feel like this, this really gets into that question of direct versus indirect effect, right? Is that effect on bone having a positive effect on the stem cell population, or is it a direct effect on the stem cell population, or is it a combination of both? And I think we need to figure that out. So we, we could look at um, this in old mice and see if, um, I suspect, like, what, okay, what we've seen from transplantation studies, like those reciprocal old to young, young to old, it's much easier to restore functionality of a middle-aged stem cell putting in a young environment compared to an old stem cell in a young environment, right? So there is that idea of past the point of no return where the accumulation of whatever changes have happened in that stem cell can no longer be restored by returning it to a young microenvironment. So that, that supports that idea. All right, great. Thanks, everybody, for coming.